We're currently in the Future Paisley exhibition space in the Paisley Piazza shopping centre. The Future Paisley exhibition itself is a bringing together of the past stories of Paisley, the exciting projects that are happening just now throughout the town, and a showcase and ideas gathering session of what we can do for the future of the town centre. So the exhibition itself is broken down into three key spaces. The first space is um, Paisley's past and it's looking at, through a series of key themes, um, a lot of historical stories about Paisley throughout the town from um, when it began all the way through to what is happening today. The kind of largest space is present Paisley and that is um, using tools of augmented reality to showcase um, exciting projects throughout the town. We have 15 information islands which um, tell these stories um, through a series of architect and designer driven um, interviews, what is going on in, in the town today. And in the future space we have a large map of the town showing what could change in the future and a series of interactive panels where people can leave their ideas behind um, to help regenerate the town going forward. Hello there everyone. Welcome to today's big conversation event looking at Paisley's historical response to global change in the 20th century. I'm Michael Davis. I'm today's chair. Now we're going to save the questions until the end of the uh, of the of everyone's session. That's when we'll have the question session. And uh, I think you're able to leave your questions uh, via um, a messaging system so that the technical support will then pass that to me. So we'll be able to uh, put your points to the, to the speakers afterwards. Well, I'm, I make no bones about it. I'm nostalgic about Paisley in the last two decades of the 20th century, which is very much when I remember um, Paisley and when I um, lived in Paisley. Um, but Although that might be part of the reason I and some of you are here, this is not a conversation. This is not a conversation. It's not a conference about nostalgia. In fact, we're going to be listening to very analytical, very hard uh, people having a very hard look uh, at their own particular research areas in Paisley's past. We're looking at Paisley in the 20th century. And the, uh, we're looking at the remarkably resilient and dynamic way in which it actually um, responded to change. Now, I think our um, job in listening to these speakers is to try and uh, join the dots between their very individual examinations of what was going on uh, during that period to try and work out um, the various challenges and responses um, that were occurring during that period and to perhaps um, think if these are still things which are uh, current, um, if these are ongoing and if we are merely looking perhaps at the, the latest chapter of these and to look at the responses as well and see um, just how Paisley was doing and how well it might do uh, in the future. Um, what I think we'll see, uh, of course I don't know yet, but what I think we'll see is a resilience and dynamism expressed through the 20th century, um, which moved Paisley from that really tight urban concentration that we see in the 19th century, this uh, industrial revolution city-state with its big concentration, its very tight concentration of, uh, uh, of money, of industry, of people. And we begin to see Paisley during the, the, um, the 20th century responding to change, becoming much more diffuse, much more dispersed, part of something uh, very much uh, larger. We may still see Paisley in terms of that um, very tight centre of the town, which is still so very important for us. We may see it in that way because perhaps to an extent we are seeing through a nostalgic gaze, but perhaps sometimes it's what we should be doing is not remembering the past so much as understanding it. And I think that's perhaps uh, what today is, seeing through the facade and seeing how change really operated uh, behind all, uh, all the, the, the glorious architecture of Paisley. Um, you might almost say 
um, the the uh, lesson perhaps that we'll we'll learn about Paisley is that for it to stay the same, uh, everything has had to change almost constantly. Um, well, we're going to start off really um, with our first speaker. We're going to begin uh, with Fiona Sinclair. Fiona is well known as a conservation architect, as a very engaging speaker, as an author and a historian. Uh, she needs very little introduction from me. Uh, and here she describes streamlining the streets. Now, this is really how Paisley's architecture underwent um, change in the 20th century, really uh, in accordance with the modern age. It was moving with the times. The architecture was reflecting that. And she'll argue that, uh, she tells me, she'll argue that with thanks to local talent, new investment, and modern initiatives, this great Renfrewshire town um, is able to present really much that's of interest from the 1920s and 30s, evidence of what exactly was going on there in the fields of housing, healthcare, retail and recreation. So Fiona, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Fiona Sinclair. I'm a conservation architect uh, specialising in work to historic buildings. Uh, doing a little bit of work in Paisley. Um, I currently live in Renfrewshire, so I'm extremely fond of the town uh, and the county, the surrounding area. And I'm here to speak to you today on streamlining the streets. This is a talk on how Paisley's architecture changed to reflect the modern age. In 1907, the Edinburgh Architectural Association staged a major exhibition in the Royal Scottish Academy in Edinburgh attracting exhibits in the form of drawings, paintings, artefacts, photographs and models from architects all across Scotland. The exhibition ran over the summer months and it occupied a number of galleries all carefully arranged to showcase the very best of Scotland's architecture. Taking up pole position in gallery number three was a magnificent model of Hippolyte Jean Blanc's Coates Memorial Church in Paisley. Lent to the exhibition by James Coates Jr. The model was one of an impressive 24 exhibits, including a drawing of Fergus Lake Park that illustrated the work of Hippolyte Jean Blanc. After all, he was the chairman of the exhibition committee. But the giant model was by far and away the most prominent site in the gallery, more than holding its own against Robert Adams' original designs for Register House and JJ Burnett's model of the Clyde Navigation Trust building on Broomielaw in Glasgow. The press reported favourably on the exhibition and many would have commented on the fact that Paisley was represented by one of the finest buildings in the show. But this was 1907, remember. The church had been completed some 13 years previously and had Blank not had such a prominent role in the design of the exhibition, perhaps visitors would have been left with a very different impression of the architecture of Paisley. By the turn of the century and the death of Queen Victoria in 1901, the thread magnates to whose munificence the town owed many of its public buildings, not to mention its reputation as an unrivalled centre of the textile industry, were commissioning fewer of the town's landmarks. The Clark and Coates families, the former with its mills at Anchor, close to the Abbey, and the latter based at Fergusley in the West, had amalgamated their respective businesses in 1896 and had already financed the Museum, Art Gallery and Library of 1868 onwards, the George A. Clark Town Hall of 1878 and the Observatory of 1884. Arguably, the mill owners had more than done their bit to sustain the well-being of the town and its occupants. Of course, there was also shipbuilding, engineering, some distilling and brick manufacture, not to mention starch and cornflour production at Brown and Polson and marmalade manufacture by James Robertson. Mary McCarthy's excellent 1969 thesis called A Social Geography of Paisley highlights that the town had a much broader based economy than its reputation as a textile centre implied. She makes the point that in 1896, the bulk of the town's labour force was in fact gainfully employed in five shipyards, 13 marine and general engineering works, 12 chemical and soap works, two fire clay works and several food firms. But the wealth and resulting philanthropy that had shaped the town physically, culturally and socially during the Victorian era would be less visible in the years that followed the birth of the 1900s. Perhaps Paisley might have been better represented at the Edinburgh exhibition by W.D. MacLennan. After all, he had been born in the town, the son of a shawl manufacturer, and had attended the John Nielsen Endowment School. 
Additionally, he was an accomplished and inspired exponent of the Art Nouveau style, whose wonderful bull in on New Street of 1901 and competition winning St. Matthew's Church on Orchard Square of 1907 signalled Paisley's willingness to embrace the 20th century, or at least the fluid forms of its emerging architecture. It's entirely possible that had the voluptuous Art Nouveau tower been built on the northeast corner of the church, that it would have given Coates Memorial a run for its money. And even if not, Paisley would have had two crown spires of major distinction, one conventional and the other just a little bit fanciful. As it is, even without its tower, MacLennan's church invites superlatives and is deserving of a far better setting than a dice with death road crossing. More conventional, yet showing the same swagger, Robert B. Miller's warehousing, shops, showroom and offices for the Paisley Provident Cooperative Society on Cosy Side Street date also to 1907 and similarly display unexpected but delightful Art Nouveau touches in the iron gates to the pend, the entrance lobby, wall and floor tiling. And I commend this to anybody who happens to be walking by and finds the gates are open. Here you have a mosaic motif depicting justice on the left and delicate thorns and roses in the entrance corridor on the right. And here galleons in full sail by the finest ceramicist around, James Duncan of Glasgow. The style of the building is Edwardian Baroque. The domed corner, the huge arches, channeled stonework and oversized detailing, much in keeping with the preferred architecture of the time. Local man Thomas, or T.G. Abercrombie, was designing for the YMCA at around the same time, but his grey ashlar corner block on High Street, despite many attractive features, is altogether more hesitant. Far more assured and impressively swagged is what was at the time the largest Methodist church in Scotland built at the corner of Gauze Street and Smith Hills Street. Designed by Glasgow architect John Watson of Watson and Salmond, it had the unusual inclusion of shops at ground floor and if not exactly light on its feet, at least had much in the way of vaguely Art Nouveau glass and a handsome galleried auditorium. These buildings and others marked the shift in style being seen across Scotland at the time. In general terms, British architecture at the beginning of the 20th century followed one of two trends, the arts and crafts or the free Baroque. In Scotland, interestingly, architectural imperatives were rather different to either end of the central belt. And while in Edinburgh, there remained a tendency towards traditionalism. In Glasgow and its near neighbour Paisley, buildings were freer in form and for the most part wonderfully confident as if anticipating the opportunities of the new century. Occasionally East would meet West however and so in the 1912 extension to the post office building on County Square the Edinburgh based architect William Aldreve, a passionate antiquarian, seems to have employed a style best described as baronial baroque although to great effect and I'm sure you'll agree creating a handsome stop end to the older Tudor Gothic building alongside. With the new century had come modern materials and emerging technologies, concrete, steel and brick as a credible rival to stone. In the hands of Paisley's architects, the humble brick was seen to be beautiful and decorative as well as functional. T.G. Abercrombie's Brodie House on Fallside Road of 1907 was built for Brown and Paulson in a lovely round arch style as part of the Royal Starch Works. And James Steele Maitland's Nether Common Carpet Factory of 1912 was quite simply a polychromatic delight. Maitland, of course, had worked for William Leeper, and I think you'll agree his inspiration was Templeton's Carpet Factory on Glasgow Green. But there was another product available at the time that was both frost and suit resistant as well as attractive, and it was called faience, or more properly, architectural terracotta. It was manufactured rather than quarried and moulded rather than hand carved. It could be used structurally as a building block or applied as a skin over a skeleton structure built in advance. And one of the earliest examples of its use externally was James Miller's Anchor Line building in Glasgow on the right, which was clad in startlingly white Carrara ware by Doulton, and it became the material of choice for many cinemas, such as here at Govan Hill in the centre. Built in 1912, Paisley's Picture House on High Street was well ahead of the game. It was still Edwardian, still classical, 
but it was modern and exciting. One of the early picture palaces built following the Cinematograph Act of 1909 to designs by cinema specialist George Boswell. Boswell had worked with James Miller was very much taken with the decorative possibilities of Fios. His most dramatic use of the material being on the La Scala in Dundee on the right. Paisley's building was shorter and without a tower, but the picture palace nevertheless brought a whiff of 20th century glamour to the south side of High Street, at last a foil to the rich French Renaissance of the late Victorian north side. And then, just as Paisley was beginning to enjoy the novelty of the Art Deco idiom, war broke out. W.D. McLennan's last known building near Houston, a factory built of reinforced concrete for the manufacture of cordite, somehow encapsulates this period, functional, brutal and utilitarian, yet dramatic and purposeful. In the aftermath, the town's commitment to honouring its war dead with dignity produced a competition winning entry for a memorial from the preeminent Scottish architect, Sir Robert Lorimer. Short of appointing Edwin Lutyens, the town couldn't have chosen more wisely. After all, Lorimer was engaged on the restoration of Paisley Abbey and had been appointed architect for the country's National War Memorial at Edinburgh Castle in 1919. Exemplary in setting, scale, stature and sculpture, with the mounted crusader and battle-weary soldiers modelled by Alice Meredith Williams, the cenotaph was part of a wider town planning exercise at the heart of Paisley and was unveiled in 1924. The interwar period saw Paisley weather the storms of depression with moderate success, but for obvious reasons, no justification could be found for many standout buildings that might rival the Victorian and Edwardian set pieces in town. Instead, the focus turned to the provision of council-built housing to address what was a huge problem of overcrowding in the area. Bisley was no stranger to having to deal with poor housing. Since the 1870s, the town council had sought to dispel the notion that Bisley was the dirtiest town in Scotland and had begun to widen the streets that were said to be amongst the narrowest in the country. The built-up area around the abbey was cleared and High Street progressively widened through a process of compulsory purchase. Furthermore, it had built tenements in the sort of numbers of which Glasgow would have been proud, and many of these were architecturally outstanding. Local architect James Donald designed no fewer than 87 tenements up to 1911, a TG Abercrombie an equally impressive number. The tenement construction had been dealt a death knell by Lord George's Finance Act of 1909, his people's budget that introduced the concept of capital gains tax, so making speculative building unprofitable. By 1919, a shortage of 1,500 houses had been identified in Paisley, and so, empowered by a new Housing Scotland Act, the local authority began to build what were described as moderately rented comfortable dwellings, or as they were more popularly referred to, homes fit for heroes. Typically, these were cottage flats laid out on garden city principles, brick and render eventually being used more commonly than stone, in large part down to generous subsidies, and although these houses would have been welcomed, there was little to distinguish them from local authority housing in other parts of Scotland. Arguably, the suburbs were being streamlined as well as the streets, but without the flair that would come a few decades later. And that flair came courtesy of J. Steele Maitland and his housing schemes built for Renfrew Borough from around 1931 onwards. One, two and three storey blocks at Moor Park Square, Jessamine Square, Tinto Square, either side of the road leading from Paisley towards Renfrew. Art Deco fused with expressionism and traditional Scots detailing given a modern continental twist. But before this, Maitland, who'd settled in Paisley in 1919, the home of his mother's birth, and found work with Abercrombie in 1921, produced the Russell Institute, a standout building if there was ever one. In a but now rare instance of private patronage, Miss Angus Russell, Agnes Russell rather, decided to commemorate her two brothers who'd been local solicitors by funding a children's health clinic. No expense was to be spared. And so the reinforced concrete frame is clad in sandstone with in full bays of glazing and bronze spandrel panels, very much in the best tradition of the great North American banks. The sculpture group by Archibald Dawson was exceptional including a depiction of his own wife and children in bronze above the main entrance and a gilded angel at rooftop level. Formally opened in 1927, many of the building's features, a 
appeared also on another fine interwar building by Maitland, the former Robert Cochrane and Sons department store on Gauze Street. Better known to many as Arnott's before its conversion into flats, this striking showroom and shopping emporium anticipated the style of architecture used for big retail in the decade that followed. The late Charles McKean, author of the seminal publication The Scottish Thirties, observed that during the 1930s, smart new shops in the cities and larger towns were springing up as CNA, Burton's, Woolworths, Marks and Spencer and others appeared, as he put it, over Hadrian's Wall from the south. What large town didn't have a Burton, clothed in glorious white faience and often occupying a corner? The clothing company's image as men's tailor of the moment was perfectly promoted by the stylishness of its many custom-built stores, most designed by its in-house architect, Harry Wilson. The Paisley branch, opened in 1931, could scarcely have been more prominently cited. Important town centre location celebrated by way of a giant order of pilasters and a crested cornice. For most, Renfrewshire's knockout building from this era simply has to be Wallace Gilbert and Partners India Tyre and Rubber Factory on Greenock Road in Inchinnan. This extraordinary building, sibling of the same firm's Firestone Factory in London, was built with giant chamfered piers, stocky raised end pylons with stylized corbels and made glorious use of coloured glazed tile. It was a remarkable site on the outskirts of the village built around airship manufacture. But it'd be wrong to say that local architects were not sufficiently seduced by 30s stylism to give it a go. Far from it. Paisley has an impressive collection of buildings from the period and they represent the opportunities arising out of changes in lifestyle and housing, technological developments and social initiatives. There was work to be had for architects in meeting the need for leisure facilities, factories, retail, healthcare and housing. Not all buildings from the period are recognisably children of the 30s. Were it not for the date stone on Thomas Baird Jr's St Mirren's Cathedral, one might be forgiven for thinking the building far older. Baird's final commission, which he marked by gifting two stained glass windows to the church, the style is Romanesque. And while a significant building for the town, it's rather serious given that its architect was a talented exponent of the arts and crafts style. Barely a stone's throw away, however, east on Glasgow Road, the janitor's house to Paisley Grammar School has none of the traditionalism of the church. Instead, there are corner metal windows, deep concrete fascia, curved planters and smooth rendered walls. Designed by J. Steele Maitland in 1938, there can be no mistaking the era of its origin. Maitland took to the stripped back style and flattened facades of the period like the proverbial duck to water. No date stone is necessary, although one does actually appear on the little office block at the foot of Orr Square on the left, for the metal framed corner bay in its concave surround says it all. Similarly, minimalism and modernism are the order of the day on High Street to the right, next to the far more decorative YMCA building by Maitland's employer and mentor Abercrombie. Kelvin House adjoining Ford's Place, also by Maitland, is hardly a good advertisement for the period given its current state, but close by on Cosy Side Street there are four good examples of the 30s style, three of which were made possible by the widening of the street that occurred at the time. First at number five, all the motifs of the period on a little three-storey office block by J.J. Gibb, who is chief draftsman to Hamilton Neal, although the sandstone pillbox perched on the corner is weirdly wonderful, even by 30s standards. Then the symmetrical frontage of number nine, which is helpfully dated, 1931, and last the Dutch expressionism of number 13, once described by Frank Walker as having rather Aztec pilasters and a reptilian ridge of a mansard. On the other side of this important thoroughfare at number 14, a department storefront from 1932 with massive centrepiece set within an even larger ashlar frame, built by Hamilton Neal, best known for his Argyle Motorworks in Alexandria. A surprising amount of construction took place in Paisley Town Centre during the 30s. Some of the buildings streamlined for reasons of aesthetic others limited by budget, and others because the setting demanded a degree of respect. John Kepi's single bay extension to the library could not have bowed more deferentially to John Honeyman's museum and art library had it tried. 
Mirren House on Baxnedden Street is jollier, the use of brick and reconstituted stone smartly done. But yet again, it was down to J. Steele Maitland to properly represent the architecture of the period, this handsome yet now neglected factory for the Four Square Tobacco Company on Green Hill Road. Flat roofed with shallow pylons, little corbels, iron framed strip glazing and bronze panelled mullions, comparison with the architect's nether common carpet factory of 25 years previously illustrates how versatile he really was as also does his White Harold Woodside Crematorium of 1937 on the left, with its glass-covered columbarium and Battersea Power Station-inspired roofscape. Maitland was not the only skilled designer in town. Here on the right, one of Scotland's finest bespoke sporting buildings, the Penny Lee Sports Pavilion of 1937. The architect of this modern movement, homage to pleasure and leisure, was Paisley's own Harry Cook of Cook and Hamilton. Celebrated for its unaltered condition, the building is symmetrical with a single story club room protruding in semicircular form beneath a terrace reached by twin curving staircases. It's a rare survivor from a period when the benefits of fresh air and fitness were becoming better recognised and is an unexpected highlight set amidst suburban sprawl. Much of what Paisley built during the period between the wars responded to context rather than setting it. The town centre buildings were in many instances infill by nature or they were restricted by the plot sizes of the buildings they replaced. Some, such as Burton's, were simply imported and others, such as the factories, were relegated to the outskirts where undeveloped land was available. Paisley's great Victorian churches and stylish Edwardian tenements were more than a match for the Glasgow equivalent, but Paisley in the 30s had no real super cinemas of note, no luxury apartments such as Kelvin Court, no icons of the era such as the Beresford Hotel. Arguably, it had few standout buildings between the wars, but what it had in spades and still does is a number of extremely good buildings from that period mostly designed by local architects who had a keen eye for European precedents and saw no reason that Paisley should be left behind in the move to modernism. And what Paisley also had was one Thomas Smith Tate, the town's most famous architectural son and extraordinary talent responsible for St Andrew's House in Edinburgh, the country's most important public building of the 1930s and described by Neil Baxter as a celebration of Scots creativity and nationhood. At around the same time as the Edinburgh project, Tate's practice, Sir John Burnett Tate and Lawn, secured a series of commissions in Renfrewshire, including a large housing scheme in Howwood, now much altered, the British Linen Bank in Johnston, and the Infectious Diseases Hospital at Hawk Head, now converted into flats. But what Paisley buddies are proudest of is the role Tate played in the design and master planning of the 1938 Empire Exhibition. Architect-in-chief, Tate delivered the largest and finest of Glasgow's four great open-air exhibitions. This one designed to promote British products and encourage trade, and of course, depict the progress of the empire. Rising from Bella Houston Hill in the shadow of war, Tate's 300 foot high observation tower could be seen from many parts of Renfrewshire and was a brief beacon of optimism, as well as a definitive statement of architectural modernism. This was streamlining par excellence. Thank you very much. Fiona, uh, thank you very much. Um, that was a lecture that was as uh, stylish and elegant as the buildings it describes. And I think it's really um, uh, very useful to, for you to set out for us in that way, uh, the progression, uh, this willingness uh, of Paisley's architects and uh, the, the uh, functions they provided for to move uh, forward, very much moving with the times. Now, um, on that very note, um, next up, uh, we turn to Professor uh, Bruce Peter from uh, Glasgow School of Art. Now, Bruce is going to examine modernity and innovation in Paisley's environs. Bruce is... Bruce is, I think, going to perhaps shock many of us. 
uh, by talking about uh, mid 20th century developments, which you might not actually think of as being Paisley. That, I suspect, is very much his point. I think he um, really is interested in explaining, I suspect, that Paisley, in moving with the times, is moving outwards. It's creating new developments which really belong in a, in a wider sense also to Renfrewshire and further fields and there are developments which are amongst the most modern in Scotland. Bruce, take it away. Thank you very, very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, absolutely correct. Uh, let's uh, begin the show. Um, could I have the first image up, please? Uh, this is a steal from Google Maps showing the uh, area that I'm concerning myself with, the, the hinterland of Paisley, um, stretching from Linwood in the southwest uh, through Paisley itself and Renfrew in Shinnan, Cardonald, Moss Park, and into the Glasgow Corner Basin with uh, Bella Houston Park that we've just heard of in relation to the Empire Exhibition uh, at the eastern extremity. Uh, in my mind, this area is in some respects a little bit like a smaller version, a much smaller version of an equivalent hinterland uh, in West London, stretching into Middlesex and into the Shires. Uh, both have, at their eastern end, a very large city, in the case of London, a huge city. Um, and in amongst them, they have a, a mixture of uh, suburban housing, uh, logistic sites, modern factories, transport infrastructure, and of course, major airports. London has got London Airport, nowadays Heathrow, one of the biggest in Europe. At Glasgow Airport at Abbots Inch is the survivor of one of several airfields that were in the Inchin and Renfrew and Abbots Inch area. So I'm going to argue that these sorts of hinterlands are intensely modern areas, and they're ones that are associated very much with the development of the internal combustion engine. They're laid out on a grand scale in a way that's hard for pedestrians to negotiate, perhaps without some form of transport, whether it's public transport or more likely their own private cars. And there are also environments created according to commercial requirements and commercial necessities. And uh, as such, there are environments that architects and planners conventionally have expressed distaste for. Here's an, an aerial photograph taken from a plane, and you can see the kind of suburban housing, industrial sites, uh, motorway infrastructure, and you know the, the, the general milieu that we're talking about. Very modern, edge of town, in some ways also quite American. And um, just to illustrate how strong the disdain could be for these sorts of environments. I'm uh, showing two uh, pieces of text from the interwar era next. One is a book written in the late 1920s by the architect and critic Clough Williams Ellis, who incidentally designed the Times Newspapers Pavilion at the Glasgow Empire Exhibition. This book is called England and the Octopus. And what Clough Williams Ellis meant by the octopus was the idea of arterial roads growing all over the place with uh, suburban developments accompanying them and these strangling the countryside and kind of creating an unsatisfactory mix of conurbation that wasn't dense enough to be city and you know had a sprawling quality that that meant that uh, 
green belt and natural environments as we would see them if green belt didn't exist in the 1920s as planning policy hadn't caught up but you know somehow this uh, uh, outward expansion from cities brought about by the rise of motor car motor cars threatened to spoil everything even more outspoken is uh, this uh, rather dystopian modernist uh, well it's in some ways modernist in its theme poem by a John Betjeman called Slough, in which he suggests that the only solution to environments of this kind that were developing in the interwar war era was to carpet bomb them, start again. And uh, he kind of links the ideas of uh, modern factories and suburban housing to a notion of moral corruption. And actually, this is not very far removed from some of the ideas Le Corbusier had in the same era of uh, using aircraft to eliminate the existing to make way for the new. In the case of Betjeman, it's the new or the new as it happened uh, resulting from commercial imperative uh, that he wanted to get rid of. So, I think the point's well made. These are environments that planners have not often loved, but they are environments that fascinate me and they're endlessly flexible environments that constantly are updated and constantly are able to accommodate the new. Um, Paisley, although one might not know it, was briefly early on a site of Scottish motor manufacture, when the Coates uh, family invested in the Arl Johnson Motor Car Company, which initially tended to make dog carts for the use on, uh, for use on, on sporting estates. Uh, Arl Johnson initially was based in Kamlaki. Uh, they had a bad fire in their factory and you know, looked as if they were going to be in real trouble. The Colts came to the rescue. And then for a, a short period in the early 20th century, they used Colts premises in Paisley before they were uh, further uh, invested in by the Beards, Moors, and moved elsewhere. Uh, Paisley, as a site of car manufacturing, uh, had an sort of on and off relationship with, uh, with, 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 with this industry, perhaps reflective of uh, Scotland's uh, problems with motor manufacture as a whole. Uh, a long time later, as we'll see, car manufacturing would return to Linwood. But in the interim, in the interwar period, a vast amount of new construction took place on the edges of the town that was planned very much with motor cars in mind. Um, after the First World War, there came a wave of construction of municipal housing, first under the Homes for Heroes scheme, but to a much greater extent under the Housing Scotland Act, uh, sometimes known as the Greenwood Act, that came to the fore in the late 1920s. And from that point on until the Second World War, very large new developments were built of uh, high quality, very nice houses, which were at the time sought after. Uh, to an extent, the planning of these uh, estates, such as Moss Park and Cardonald, was inspired by the Garden Cities movement. And uh, this little strip of a postcard that I've uh, cropped in the top image shows, you know, it's been framed especially to show the wide boulevard in, in the foreground, uh, as, as the car axis was clearly something that was considered very modern about this housing and something that the creators were proud of. So the idea of the garden cities kind of comes to Scottish suburbia in the central belt, and there are some very, very good examples in the housing estates that are in the Paisley area. Car manufacturing also had subsidiary industries, and one of those was the making of pneumatic rubber tires. And the superb uh, 
uh, India of Inshinan factory complex designed by Wallace Gilbert and partners at Inshinan. It's, it's a wonderful example of an interwar factory for the motor industry and comparable actually with uh, other buildings that the same architects designed in West London. For, his, for example, the Firestone factory that was at uh, Perry Vale, but unfortunately was demolished in the late 1970s. Uh, here's another view of an environment that is uh, near Paisley and that is also very, very uh, dependent on road transport, both to bring workers to it and to remove uh, the manufactured goods. This is the Hillington Industrial Estate, a giant uh, depression-busting uh, industrial enterprise in which new light industries and distribution organizations could find modern premises. And uh, not only is the planning created around the car. You can see in the foreground, the Glasgow to Paisley and the Ayrshire railway lines, the Glasgow and Southwestern railway that once was uh, passing right by, you know, industrial complexes in Britain in earlier eras usually had great networks of railway sidings going into them, but not Hillington Industrial Estate. This is created around the use of road vehicles. Also of significance is the way that the elements, the, the factory buildings and the warehouse buildings were constructed using light steel frames, uh, often roofed in huge expanses of asbestos cement sheeting, that magical light fireproof material that came to the fore in a major way in the interwar era and allowed uh, factory units and other building types to be thrown up with unprecedented speed. Now, although most of the uh, facades of the units in Hillington Industrial Estate are, as one might expect, fairly banal, one can certainly tell that they're of the 1930s, there were a, a couple of buildings amongst them that were quite uh, striking, actually. The, the, the little images uh, on the right-hand side I've actually stolen from uh, Charles McKean's wonderful book, The Scottish Thirties from 1987. But of course, time moves on and industrial estates require to be constantly updated. Uh, the car industry also was involved in Linwood in the interwar eras through the press steel plant. Uh, this was a very big uh, complex. Uh, press steel had been founded only in 1926 and uh, just on the verge of the depression beginning in the early 30s, they expanded to open a factory uh, in Linwood. And this made car body panels, amongst other things. So although it wasn't making whole motor vehicles, it was making major components for these as part of wider manufacturing processes involving other car factories in Coventry and Oxford and elsewhere in the, in the country. And post-war, interestingly, the press steel factory became a builder of trains. This is uh, one of the uh, Class AM3 suburban electric trains that were built there in the early 1960s for the electrification of the Glasgow suburban routes. And very popular and successful they were too. Perhaps some of the best designed artifacts of the British Rail Modernization Plan. And then after the war, one had the Roots Factory at Linwood, a very modern car plant that unfortunately had rather a short life because of a complexity of uh, negative factors uh, relating to industrial problems and uh, big changes in the, in the Scottish industrial economy. But nonetheless, car manufacturing, this sort of manufacturing industry built around roads was very important in the Paisley industry. And I think the point's well made. Now for the next bit, I'm going to look briefly at air travel. There were several major airfields uh, in the Paisley area, in Shinnan, Renfrew and Abbots Inch. 
And uh, those became important locations for civil and commercial aviation. And uh, amongst the various operators, uh, one was the London Midland and Scottish Railway, which moved into the, the operation of a network of air routes for those who could afford it, uh, the Royal Mail, and also the Scottish Motor Traction Company, uh, a large bus operator in Orted in Edinburgh, but also with major operations in West Central Scotland through its uh, Central SMT and Western SMT subsidiaries. Well, it was also an operator of air taxis and other aircraft services. The building of airport infrastructure uh, around uh, the Paisley area is a story in itself. Uh, some very striking buildings were constructed. Uh, William Kinnanmouth's remarkable uh, terminal at Renfrew Airport from the early 1950s with its parabolic concrete arch was very short-lived, but surely must be one of the most striking uh, examples of what one might see as a sort of transatlantic version of the Festival of Britain style in Scotland. And then uh, from uh, a little over a decade and a half later, we've got Basil Spence's very elegant design for Glasgow Airport, uh, a building complex that has been uh, much abused in more recent time. It's been uh, extended in unsympathetic ways. And sadly, now it's very hard to see how architecturally elegant and coherent uh, it once was. It now perhaps better resembles uh, the, the Dutch architect Rem Kohlhaas's concept of junk space. But again, that is you know, commercial necessity maybe, and, and, and perhaps in a less uh, admirable way, uh, reflective of, of air travel's expansion and the modernity of the whole thing. There's an aerial view of Glasgow Airport at its current extent. So the hinterlands of Paisley keep on evolving and they continue to be very up-to-date places. Uh, one of my former colleagues at Glasgow School of Art, the architect uh, Gordon Gibb, some years ago carried out a magnificent restoration and conversion project on the derelict former India tire factory at Inshinan. Uh, now it's occupied by companies involved in digital technology and gaming and uh, things that uh, address uh, consumer desires and demands in the 21st century. And it's the most marvelous combination of old and new. And I think a, a model of good practice in terms of combining a listed building with very obvious architectural qualities that was very modern in its day with new uses and an annex, which is also in itself a, a fine fine structure. And just beside that, of course, there's the Rolls-Royce Aero Engines factory, though uh, it is not architecturally distinguished at all. Uh, Gordon Gibb, incidentally, offered to do a better design for Rolls-Royce and they weren't interested. And when he asked them why, he said, they said, we don't need a nice looking factory because once the Rolls-Royce name is on it, it'll be perfect. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bruce, very much. Uh, I, I think indeed the, the, the Rolls-Royce name was on that uh, presentation. It was indeed perfect. Uh, uh, thank you. It's a really fascinating look at what I suspect uh, many of people who are interested in Paisley would not actually uh, uh, initially thought of as being such a relevant development. It, it I suppose, it shows Paisley as part of a whole regional development. And as Paisley is actually perhaps losing some things from its city centre, uh, population uh, going to the new housing schemes, industry moving out and so on, all part of a, of, of a process, yet Paisley itself is becoming heart of uh, the centre of these developments in transportation, infrastructure, um, uh, commerce, which are all going on uh, round about it. Um, 
Thank you for that uh, very much indeed. Of course, uh, uh, I suppose uh, later on we might consider how there's a, a sting in the tail of this as retail, of course, becomes something that is also um, in a very vibrant way made use of, but bringing things out with Paisley, giving a, a, a need for reinvention. But that's something that perhaps we can we can consider in, in questions. I suppose it's really the reason that we are all here and we're part of this project in, in the first place. So thank you very much for helping build that up. We're now going to have a break. Uh, we're going to have, in fact, a 15 minute break. Uh, we are uh, ahead of ourselves and uh, we will stop for 15 minutes. And if you could rejoin us uh, at three o'clock, uh, we'll be ready for our next talk. Remember as well that the questions come uh, at the very end. And if you have questions, do please uh, keep uh, messaging them uh, to us and we'll deal with them all when we have the panel all assembled. Okay, time for you easily to go off and make yourself a cup of tea, maybe even to drink it. See you later.
Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, welcome back to the second uh, part of our uh, big conversation on past Paisley, basically looking at uh, the changes and challenges uh, which happened uh, to Paisley and the surrounding area during the 20th century, and particularly at how uh, um, uh, responses to this uh, uh, occurred. Uh, now we're going to uh, have a talk, if you welcome, if you would, uh, Morwena Kearsley. And Morwena is going to intriguingly give us a talk called Pastel Coloured Machinery. Now, now this, I'm told, uh, uh, hangs around uh, a 1947 exhibition which occurred in Paisley, um, a, a, a combined uh, effort by the Paisley Thread Industry and also by the Town Corporation, in which they managed to attract 42,000 people, uh, an enormous total, uh, to Paisley Town Hall. And essentially, they were um, attempting to counter the changes that had been caused by the Second World War, and they were attempting also to attract um, more women into their workforce. And they were also trying to make their work working conditions um, uh, more uh, suitable for them. Now, Marwena is going to uh, discuss this, she tells me, but also she's going to uh, discuss uh, rather more about a whole artistic project to, uh, to transform archive material into um, art, uh, to become art itself. Uh, Marwena, um, over to you. I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Orla and I'm a visual artist based in Glasgow, working primarily with photography and uh, lens-based media. In my presentation today, I'm going to talk about an exhibition that happened in Paisley in 1947 called Paisley Plans Ahead. And I came to know about this exhibition quite unintentionally um, by coming across a, a beautifully archived box of photographs and newspaper clippings in the University of Glasgow archives, which helped inspire a whole new series of collaborative works, which I will talk about in just a wee while. So in 2019, I was lucky enough to be selected as artist in residence for Picturing Paisley, a project that aimed to use photography to discuss and explore Paisley's history of textiles and thread manufacturing, with a particular emphasis on the built environment. Much of that residency involved designing and facilitating photography workshops with three groups of people, uh, all interested in photography and brought together by the Disability Resource Centre, Outspoken Arts and West College Scotland's Photography Department. So as well as delivering workshops and learning about Paisley's incredible history, which I have to admit I didn't know a huge amount about before this residency, and making photographs in and around the town, I also spent some time in the University of Glasgow archives. And yeah, like I said, I wasn't looking for anything in particular. I actually wanted to learn a bit more about the famous families of Paisley's thread manufacturing industry, the Colts and the Clarks. And as has been mentioned in, in a previous talk in 1896, the Colts and the Clark thread manufacturing firms merged to form JMP Coates Limited. And at the time they had a market value of 22 million pounds and employed over 50,000 employees worldwide. So it was during one of those visits to the archive that I came across a box containing press cuttings and photographs documenting an exhibition called Paisley Plans Ahead. And at first, I was drawn in by this image here, which I, I didn't know what it was. I thought it might be a set for a sci-fi movie or a war room drama or something like that. But then as I sifted through the material, it became clear that Paisley Plans Ahead was actually quite an ambitious and significant public event. So it was staged at Paisley Town Hall by JMP Coates, along with the United Thread Mills and Paisley Corporation in May 1947. And Paisley Plans Ahead ran for two weeks and 42,000 people came to visit it. Functioning both as a trade fair and as a recruitment drive after the devastating consequences of the Second World War, its aims mirrored those of other exhibitions on at the time, such as Britain Can Make It, 
which was held only seven months earlier at the V&A in London in 1946. Britain Can Make It aimed to present Britain as an innovative, forward-thinking and creative nation that could compete in a post-war global market. Paisley Plans Ahead also opened just five days after the British Industries Fair, which was held in Errol's Court in London. Just like Britain Can Make It and Paisley Plans Ahead, it showed the range of products designed and manufactured in the UK at that time and would have helped drive investment and recruitment into these industries. So, Paisley Plans Ahead aim to get JMP Coates back to their pre-war manufacturing power. The Second World War had left their business and businesses and profits depleted. One of the most pressing concerns was a severely reduced workforce. And as the archival news clippings explain, a UK wide recruitment drive was being rolled out, aimed specifically at women. They realised that improved working conditions were essential to attract and maintain a new workforce. And that's what um, the exhibition Paisley Plans Ahead lays out, advancements in technology and improvements in working conditions. So for me, when I'm working with an archive, I like to think about the material I'm looking at in relation to the history of photography, because that's what I'm interested in. So what was happening in photography at this time? Well, during the Second World War, photojournalists were able to use smaller, lightweight cameras and the resulting photographs could be transmitted for the first time across oceans by radio and across continents by wire. So these are two photographs by one of my favourite photographers, Lee Miller, who I always try and shoot one into any talk I'm doing. And her pictures here show some of the important, uh, so some of the women uh, working in important roles during the Second World War. After the conscription of women was introduced in 1941, women were given a choice of working in industry or joining one of the auxiliary or nursing services. And photographs and photo stories by people like Lee Miller really helped to underscore the importance of a female workforce. So it could be argued that industrialists such as JMP Cole had taken the needs and concerns of a female workforce more seriously. The Paisley Plans Ahead exhibition was an opportunity to explain some of the beneficial changes they wanted to make to the mills in Paisley. Some of the, the changes that the, the company planned to implement were things like pastel coloured machinery to help avoid accidents, noiseless machinery and energy conserving equipment. Some of the additions were a wee bit more trivial, as this quote from a newspaper article describes, and I quote, there will be the provision of powder rooms for the girls. These are so carefully planned that even lockers have been measured to accommodate the shoulder width of the fur coats which all the workers aim to buy. But let's also look at the visual strategies implemented by the exhibition designers to both present their new vision for the mills clearly, but also to generate a bit of excitement, get people actually sign on as workers. So here in this slide, you can see more of the plans for improvement laid out, laid out in a way that I think echoes advertising, in particular, the use of a clean, bold type that speaks directly to the viewer. They also used display boards, which explained and potentially demystified the processes taken in. The exhibition designers also commissioned models to show how within five years, the mill planners hope to re-equip the existing factories to achieve the best working conditions and create new purpose-built factories at sites in Fergusley and Nether Craigs. The exhibition also included these wee suggestion boxes and I believe the company paid a small fee for any suggestions that they ended up using, which again to me sounds like a classic advertising gimmick. So over the next few slides we can have a look at some of the stands, which I'm sure you agree you can see are beautifully dressed and designed and showcase the range of products sold by JMP Coates and United Thread Mills at the time.
So now I want to talk about some of the work that myself and other people produced after looking at the Paisley Plans exhibition. Around about the same time as I was digesting these uh, pictures from Paisley Plans Ahead, I was lucky enough to be working on uh, another job, making some still live images with the fashion designer Becca Lipscomb to advertise garments and accessories for the fashion label Atelier EB, which is the company name under which Becca and the artist Lucy McKenzie sign their collaborative projects. And I'm sure you can see the visual link between the display on the left from Paisley Plans Ahead and the documentation of Atelier EB's full shop front for which they employ a professional window dresser, probably quite like the person that, that dressed the shows for Paisley Plans Ahead. So I was thinking and learning about these forms of display and was especially taken by looking at the folds and forms that draped fabric creates. I produced uh, this series of work uh, called Velvet Dreams of Silky Gauzes, which depict various draped textiles, including some from, from Becca's studio. To me, they evoke the abstracted female form or suggest the curves and folds of domestic furnishings. I wanted to reference the, the drive to bring women into the workforce as described in the Paisley Plans Ahead newspaper clippings, as well as the company's kind of more general desire to sell fabrics and threads to women. Other images reference the movement, noise and vibrations of the machinery operated by the workers. The images were made in a pitch black room with a moving iPhone torch to uh, illuminate the fabrics over a long exposure time, which in some oblique way perhaps references the eventual closure of the mills and the demolition of many of the buildings associated with the thread manufacturing industry in Paisley. This is work that I absolutely intend to revisit and to, to add to over the coming years, so it's still a kind of live project. This work was shown uh, as part of a collaborative exhibition alongside workshop participants from the three groups I mentioned earlier. We were due to plan a larger end of project exhibition, which would have mirrored some of the display choices you see in, in Paisley Plans Ahead, but COVID happened and uh, that became impossible. But hopefully you can see here how elements from Paisley Plans Ahead uh, made its way into some of our workshops. So on the, on the right, you can see the, they're the cast hands of some of the participants from the Disability Resource Centre group, uh, which we then photographed as still lives. And together, we also visited the University of Glasgow archives and were shown an amazing selection of images by Claire McDade, who worked there at the time. And based on what we were looking at and talking about, we also made a series of collaborative cut-up poems, one of which you can see there, and text pieces in reference to Paisley's history of textiles and thread manufacturing. We also used new and found photographs to reimagine a Paisley skyline or a Paisley street using collage and sewing to literally fuse together the contemporary and the historical. I also ran uh, still life workshops at the same time as I was doing my still life work. And it's just so interesting to me to see how each participant took their work in a, in a completely different direction. So I'll show you a few examples of that now. Uh, this is work by Carol Gledhill, who decided to use a real census return from a close in Paisley to inspire her to create a photo story about a day in the life of a mill girl. She also created, Carol created this beautiful sewn photograph depicting her granny, Jane Tavendale, who I'm told was a brilliant knitter. The photograph was taken by Carol's father in the late 1950s, printed by me in 2019, and given a new layer of interpretation by Carol's beautiful, delicate stitching onto the photograph. This is a, from a series by Catherine Lynch, who photographed her Paisley shawl and inserted the pattern into the architecture of the city of the town in a way that really made me think about the layers of history and culture that can be seen in the built environment of a place. 
Karen Bohm's work, Radical Threads, shows us details from buildings around the town, which tell us more about its industrial past, paired with inspirational and political quotes by local luminaries. There is so much work to talk about, and I, I don't unfortunately have the time to do that today. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to flag up the Picturing Paisley Photography Group, first brought together for our project, but still operating as an active collective who continue to document and archive Paisley's built environment. They currently have an outdoor exhibition on in Paisley right now. So please give them a wee follow on Instagram uh, to keep up to date with all their brilliant you can also see uh, more works um, made for the, the wider project Picture in Paisley um, in this video, which I made in lieu of that final exhibition I was talking about. So that's online. And if you Google it, I'm sure you will find it easily. So I am going to end this talk with one last dip into the archive. I started this presentation by talking about Paisley Plans Ahead, which was staged as a trade fair and as a persuasive call out for people, particularly women, to join the workforce. It seems from the, from the 1950s onwards, the mill and the industry were a huge source of post-war employment in the town. I was told by, by one of the participants uh, from the Disability Resource Centre group, John, that when he was a lad, growing up in Paisley, you could leave a job one day and have started a, a, in another by the next day. Paisley Plans Ahead happened in 1947, as we know, and this photograph that we're looking at now gives us an insight into the state of employment in Paisley 43 years later, just a few months before the official end of the Cold War in 1989. Unfortunately, it's, it's especially poignant to think about this now, as Russia invades Ukraine and the start of a potential new Cold War begins. So I'm going to read out a quote from a, a, a newspaper article from the Scotsman dated July uh, 1989. And there's two things that are important to know before, before I read the quote. And the first one is that the mill in Russia that the article refers to was appropriated uh, at the time of the 1917 Russian Revolution, and that JMP Coates merged with Vantona Viella in 1986 to create Coates Viella, which is their company that still exists today. So I'll read the quote to you now. A Soviet deputy minister saw the future of Paisley yesterday, and she found that it works 365 days of the year. Alexandra Biryakova, a leading member of the USSR Council of Ministers, visited the Coates Viella thread mill ostensibly to view modern mass manufacturing. The 4,500 workers at the Kirov mill in Russia may come to regret that their forebears threw Coates out because the company's return may bring a capitalist counter-revolution that could hit their jobs. Ominously, Mrs. Biryakova was particularly impressed by the capacity of the machinery at the Paisley Anchor Mills to produce thread on a non-stop basis. The fact hardly a human being in sight as the machines spun on towards their target of 25 tonnes of thread a week may have been noticed by the person who has been given the task of bringing perestroika to the Soviet textiles industry. At Paisley, Mrs. Buryakova was surprised to see a much higher proportion of men in what she said used to be a female profession. We are up present day. This is a screen grab from Coates Viella's webpage, which describes its final move from the industrial to the digital age. Most of the mills in Paisley, as I understand it, had stopped production in the 1970s, and many of the buildings displayed in the Paisley Plans Ahead exhibitions as beacons of modernity were demolished in the 1980s and 1990s. You can also see an image from the future Paisley exhibition on right now in the Piazza Centre. And it's, it's interesting to me that the future Paisley exhibition has echoes of Paisley plans ahead in terms of its visual strategies and use of contemporary technology. 
I'm keen to find out how this exhibition will be archived so that some other artist, researcher or interested member of the public can find it, just like we did with Paisley Plans Ahead and use it to reflect on the time we're living in right now from the vantage point of the future. That is the end of my presentation and thank you very much. Morwenna, thank you very much indeed. Um, it, that really was a, a, a very a, a interesting to make that fascinating link between those two exhibitions and, and to bridge it in the way you did um, with, with the, uh, really vibrant and touching evocations. I think I've scribbled down in my notebook. It really is. And I thought you hit the, uh, the spot on a number of occasions, um, especially uh, for me, I think also the, the, the way that past past history is in a sense by by your art uh, being been recycled reimagined and, and given a, a new life i think that that uh, was very very worthwhile to to hear you talk about and describe these things and to show some of these um we're now uh, going to move on to the the last of our four lectures and we're going to hear Dr. Valerie Wright. Uh, now, Dr. Dr. Wright or Valerie is from the University of Glasgow, and she's going to look at Paisley's post-war uh, reconstruction, which is, I suppose, the third in these uh, uh, historical surveys we've been looking at, quite analytical surveys, things to, to really uh, um, open our eyes, I think, to an understanding uh, of the past. And I, I suspect that um, uh, Valerie's uh, um, uh, uh, description and analysis is just going to be as vibrant as any of the other lectures' presentations. <laughs> Take it away, Valerie. Thank you. We can, we can hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm just going to put on the first slide here. Oh. Thank you very Oh, wait a minute. Here we are. Okay, so as Mike says, I'm a historian, a researcher based at the University of Glasgow, and I'm currently working on a project looking at the Scottish new towns. Um, I've previously worked on projects on high rise housing in Glasgow and um, the process and effects of deindustrialisation in Scotland. So housing, the economy and regional planning are among the main themes that I've been interested in over the past few years. And you'll see that this very much influences what I'll be talking about today in relation to Paisley. So as you'll see, Paisley was not always exceptional. Many of the changes in the town could be found throughout urban Scotland and beyond. Um, but Paisley was at times ahead of the curve and ambitious in its vision in the immediate post-war decades. So I should say that I'm a proud Paisley buddy. I grew up in the town and since 2015, I've been back living in the town. Uh, most of my extended family all live in Paisley too. My dad's got seven sisters, about five of them live in the town. So I think it's fair to say that I'm pretty biased in my assessment of Paisley. So you, you'll need to take that into consideration. Um, also growing up in the 1980s, I've got a real fondness for the post-war sort of modernist architecture and planning that I'm going to be discussing today. I know that not everyone's so keen, so I think this is when the chat will start to fill up with questions and comments. We'll see. We hope so. Okay, so here we go. Let's start with housing. So you'll have assumed that Paisley would have followed Glasgow's lead in terms of housing policy. And while this is often the case, sometimes Paisley was a pioneer, as we'll be finding out in a little minute. The main problem facing Glasgow in the post-war years, as many people will already know, was overcrowding. Families are living in single ends. Uh, for those of you who don't know what single end is, it's essentially a one room uh, occupancy. There's no inside toilets. Some conditions were pretty awful. Parts of Paisley were no different. The problem with the same roots in Paisley as it did elsewhere in the west of Scotland, industrial expansion in the 19th century. In Paisley's case, this was the thread mills um, and other industries. And, and this has re resulted in dramatic migration to the town. Um, However, at this time, um, the housing in the town was mainly three and four storey tenements in 18th century uh, cottages. So I grew up in McCarroll Street in the East End, and that's pretty typical um, of these tenements. Um, and they're pretty good quality, but there were literally like, three small flats in every floor rather than the two that you would find now. So prior to the First World War, the town's population was nearly 100,000. And today, just for comparison, it's 77,400. Um, all of these uh, people were housed in a relatively small geographic area. Housing densities are really high, overcrowding is a major problem. This leads to high infant mortality, 
um, contagious diseases such as tuberculosis spread really easily in such conditions, hence the need uh, for Hockhead um, Infectious Diseases Hospital. So there's little public intervention in housing at this point. There's not much, if any, municipal housing at all. Um, most of the tenements that you would find in the town in the, um, post, you know, prior to the First World War um, were privately owned. Uh, landlords could set the, the price um, in terms of rent when, when demand is high, it's simple economics. Um, in fact, in the 1930s, there are uh, mass protests in the town with 600 women man, uh, marching on the county buildings in protest of rent increases in 1938. So you could see that this, this could lead to significant problems in the town. Um, as we heard earlier on, interwar housing legislation enabled, enabled the council to build schemes uh, such as Whitehall and Gala Hill, among others, helped to alleviate the problem. But overcrowding and poor housing conditions remained. This was mainly because not all working class people could afford to pay uh, the increased rents in these new areas. They mainly catered, um, it's similar in Glasgow areas like Moss Park and Knightswood, they, they mainly end up catering for the lower middle classes and the skilled working classes because in the west of Scotland, wages are simply not, you can't charge economic rents on the wages, we're a low wage economy in the west of Scotland at that point in time. So those in greatest need, those living in the most overcrowded tenemental areas in, in Paisley, remain in such conditions. So in the post-war years, council, held it, council housing uh, building increases dramatically. Um, and throughout the second, well, following the Second World War, um, there's a Labour government in power. We've got the advent of the National Health Service and decent affordable housing for the working classes becomes an important objective. And it's argued that this should be provided by the state. So as was the case in Glasgow, there are two strategies. Extend the boundaries of the town by building further peripheral estates. Um, and the second strategy is, is, is to increase housing density within the boundaries of the town. So build high. So the question is, does Paisley adopt the same housing policy as Glasgow? Well, yes. In fact, Paisley actually takes the lead in terms of planning and comprehensive development. Paisley is the first borough to embark on planned modern redevelopment drive and in 1944 a self-contained strategy was drafted which includes peripheral house building followed by decanting, clearance and rebuilding of central sites. So the Scottish Housing Act of 1946 enables the council to extend the boundaries of the town, build new housing estates and what had been farmland. The first estate is Hunter Hill and that's where my dad grew up um, and this is completed in 1950. Initially, Hunter Hill was entirely low-rise terraced housing, although there were four, um, a few sort of four-storey deck access flats and some uh, prefabs have survived to the present day that were put in uh, during the war. Paisley has a lot of experimental housing, um, in fact, so if, if you know the town Stockholm Terrace, there's some Scandinavian timber-framed housing which still survives to the present day. Later, as was the case in Glasgow and elsewhere in Scotland, high-rise blocks uh, are added uh, to peripheral estates in Paisley also. So this photograph here, taken by my colleague Miles Glendinning in the early 80s, um, shows you um, the, these sort of high blocks that are put in in existing peripheral estates. Um, these blocks are no longer there and I could go in, into great detail as to why high-rise has not survived um, in, in every area where it where it was put up in the 1960s. Also, I could tell you many a story about the little children that used to go and play in the lifts uh, in these flats when uh, they didn't live there. Um, so, the, yeah, what's going on uh, in high rise uh, in the 1960s? So, this takes us on to some of the other uh, peripheral housing estates in Paisley. So, for those of you who know the town, uh, this is when Glenburn, Fox Bar and Fergusley Park are all sort of uh, built and expanded. So Glenburn was the first housing estate built in Paisley during the 1950s. Uh, the scheme was considered a success and provided terraced, semi-detached and tenement council housing for families sort of leaving uh, the single ends and dilapidated housing in the town centre. Um, some of the design for, I'm mean, not an architectural historian, but I know that my colleagues are always quite excited by some of the churches uh, that are put in. Um, and there's one in particular in Glenburn which is considered to be quite a good example of a, a post-war church. Um, Fox Bar is built between 1952 and 1965 and it's located to the south of the town near the Glenifer Braes. 
It's been suggested again that this is one of the best areas to live in the town at the time um, because of its semi-rural environment. So in its early years, it was hailed a success in that it housed a large number of people in a healthy environment and many residents were happy in their new homes. This scheme was built by the Scottish Special Housing Association with funding coming through central government uh, via the Scottish office. SSHA estates were always considered to be a cut above um, because the SSHA could select good tenants. This was, uh, there was a sort of feeling that if you lived in an SSHA estate, you were a bit better and more respectable than other folk in other council estates. Um, this is what I've been, you know, heard over the years in talking to folk. Um, then we've got Fergusley Park, which was actually built in stages from the 1920s all the way through to the 1960s. And there's several types of housing here, from four and a block cottage flats to two to four storey tenements and deck access blocks of two to four storeys too. Um, the sort of higher density housing was built in the sort of post-war decades. I mean, the allocations policy that the council had in the, the immediate post-war decades ensured that, you know, some some estates gained uh, different rep different um, reputations than than others, and we can talk about that in more detail if people are interested. Um, but all of them were pretty good quality uh, housing estates in terms of how they were built. Okay, but the town couldn't ex continue to sp expand outwards. Um, you know, to the east of the town, we've we've already run into Glasgow at the, the, the sort of urban sprawl that we discussed, like, you know, suburban ribbon development that is Ralston. Um, we're close to Eldersley in the west. REF Abbotsinch is to the north, which is we were here and becomes Renfrew, then Glasgow Airport. And then to the south, the green belt that is Glenifer Braes becomes protected. So you couldn't expand outwards. Um, so what did you do? Paisley Corporation actually already had plans to build to higher density, including the use of high flats in the 1950s. So the Paisley's development plan by J.A. McGregor, who's described as a powerful borough engineer. These men had great power, uh, the borough engineers, was the first in the country to be approved in 1953. It's the first comprehensive redevelopment development area, the CDAs as they were described, um, at George Street and Canal Street. It was underway in 1955, two years before Hutchison Town Gorbo's CDA in Glasgow, which was the first one in Glasgow. Um, so it's really interesting. Paisley could be considered a sort of pioneer of inner city redevelopment in Scotland in that period. So we were two years ahead of, of these uh, contemporaries through in Glasgow. Okay, so here is um, George Street and Canal Street today. Phase A of this scheme was comprised of four courts of maisonettes and tenement flats, uh, smokeless dis district heating, uh, communal laundries. Um, some of them still exist today. You can go and have a wee peek in. Uh, the flats had all mod cons. The scheme was completed in 1965. It was a great success at the time. Uh, the 15-storey tower at the end of the scheme, George Cooler, was completed in 1969 and I think it is still one of the most popular in the town. It's always you know, got a waiting list of people who are keen to get in. Um, for me, this sort of mass construction of council housing really signifies a shift in the expectations of the working classes. It's a response um, of the politicians in power to try and keep their votes. Essentially, people wanted improved housing. So after the Second World War, people are simply not willing to put up with the exploitation of paying rents for very poor quality housing. The late 1940s and the early 1950s are stereotypically seen as an optimistic time and the working classes wanted part of this new world that was being built, part of the social settlement that included the welfare state, the council housing and the NHS. In terms of housing, this involved indoor toilets, hot running water, central heating, and if you were really lucky, your own front and back door. And by that, we mean a wee garden uh, at the back, not just a shared back court. All of this um, housing is in modern designs and new buildings, decent space standards, not tiny pokey rooms. Um, I've spoken to people who moved up to Castle Milk and, and moved into high flats in the Gorbos in the post-war years and they were just talked about how their mothers were overwhelmed by the fact that they didn't have to clean bed bugs and vermin and mice 
and all the sort of expectations and the cleaning that was involved, living standards were vastly improved by places like um, CDA areas like George Street. People's everyday lives were just improved drastically. Um, this was an era in which council housing was aspirational. If your name came up on the list, you were deserving. Depending on exactly where you ended up in Paisley told you exactly how much you deserved. Remember that potential tenants were vetted and visited by housing officers who checked not only their rent books to make sure that you had no arrears, but also the cleanliness of your home. So it wasn't just about what you did for a living, you were inspected before you were allowed to get a new council house. And here we've got the tenant's handbook. So what's clear is that in the post-war years, living in council housing was something to be proud of. And with this went supervision, control and lots of rules and advice from the council. So the Municipal Tenants Handbook was extensive. There was rules and regulations on what you could and couldn't do in your home, but also an advice on everything from DIY to gardening. And obviously there was kitchen tips for the women. Um, men didn't really obviously, theoretically didn't go near their kitchens in those days, but you know, it was always women that was advice on how, how to manage your kitchen. Um, the council are essentially saying, we've given you a house and you'd better look after it. In some areas of the town, there were spot checks uh, were carried out. People would come in unannounced to see what sort of state the housing was in. Um, there was even areas of supervised housing in the town too. Um, rents were higher in council housing than they had been in tenements, which meant um, it was fine when everybody had employment, but as, as the 20th century wears on, especially with the, the 1970s, it becomes increasingly difficult for people to heat their homes. Um, I always tell a story of a lovely couple I interviewed in Castle Milk and I, I asked about rent arrears um, and Carol told me that, you know, oh yes, yeah, the, in the, the high flats she lived in, the council would put up a list of everybody in arrears to try and shame those people who hadn't managed to pay their rent. But she said everyone's name was on it, so nobody was ever ashamed. <laughs> and I thought that was quite interesting. Just that in the new housing, the rents were so much higher that people really struggled to find the money, even though <clears throat> they wanted to live in nice new housing. And the council were trying to be as economic as they could in terms of charging the lowest rent they could, but they had to run the house. So it's just, it's, it's quite a difficult time, especially as the 20th century wears on. Okay, so slum clearance, and I'll say like um, slum clearance with inverted commas, uh, and comprehensive redevelopment and construction of new housing was informed by modernity and modern design principles. But new housing isn't all that's going on in Paisley in the immediate post-war decades. There was also an ambitious plan to remake the town centre. So controversially, this involved the demolition of the old jail. And I'm going to be controversial here myself because I say, who needs a Victorian jail in the centre of Paisley in 1963? What was the future in 1963? Let's let's cast our eyes back and think about what what the planners of those days were thinking about, rather than you know recriminations of lost heritage. So, well, as there was the case for many towns in the UK, the future was modern shopping centres, mostly in brutalist concrete. That that's just the reality of the moment. Um, Paisley's piazza was actually pioneering. Um, it did cover up the river car. There was a mix of shops and offices catering to an expanded white collar services workforce, not to mention the expansion of the town's council offices as part of Paisley Civic Centre. Um, in fact, the methods used in the construction of the piazza were so groundbreaking that videos were taken of them pouring the concrete to show civil engineering you know, students all around the, the country. So yes, very interesting. So I'm going to move on quickly because I'm running out of time. So Decomo Deco Scotland, the branch of the International Organisation for the Celebration of Modernist Architecture, is particularly excited by Paisley Civic Centre. So the three young architects who won the competition to build uh, the centre, uh, the Civic Centre, went on to form a practice of the back of their win. Um, their first commission, uh, you know, is of Hutchison, Locke and Monk, goes on to be an important in the Brutalist movement in Britain. As you can see, a detail from the Civic Centre is in the front of this retrospective of their work and a photograph of this part of the building accompanies Hutchison's obituary in the Architects' Journal in 2015. So this building is really significant in, in the history of architecture in Britain. Uh, their original design for the Civic Centre was meant to be so much more extensive than it was. Maybe it's lucky it wasn't. 
Um, but the county buildings in the Piazza have always been really polarising, and most folk in the town probably think they're just ugly concrete. For me, I've got a fondness of those grey skies, grey concrete days of having to be taken around the town from a moment to pay the gas bill and the electric bill and then try to shelter from the rain in the piazza, which was open to the elements in those days. Um, but this showpiece, um, Brutalism, is the kind of height of modernity. The architectural competition in itself was testament to the council's ambitions for the town. So the original architectural team involved in the Civic Centre along with the, the Comomo Scotland, were dismayed by the demolition of one of the council buildings and the undermining of their original design. However, just as had been the case in 1963, when the town didn't need a prison anymore, in the late 2010s, we have to argue, did the, the council need all that office space? I wonder if we'll regret the demolition, um, but at the same time, you know, the way people mourn the passing of the jail, but I think that remains to be seen. Um, so yes, there's this uh, emotional attachment to space and place, which is worth considering. Okay, so round off, and I think this will lead us nice into the questions, so I think for the last, I can get away with this. It brings me nicely um, to, in, in terms of what's going on in the town today um, and responding to crisis. So both in terms of the housing crisis and the death of the high street. So those of you who have been in and seen the Future Paisley exhibition have seen the plans that the council has for the future of the town. So just as, as was the case in the 1950s and 1960s, housing is a significant role in the regeneration of the town. But this time the aim is to bring people back to live in the town centre. Affordability is key, as was the case in the post-war decades, housing for rent as well as to buy. And whereas large shopping centres were required in the 1960s as shopping habits changed, now the growth of online shopping results in less in need for less retail floor space in our town centres. So the conversion of existing buildings and brownfield sites into affordable housing, therefore, potentially solves two problems, while hopefully also attracting more leisure facilities such as cinemas, restaurants, cafes. Um, our town's doing a wonderful job of investing in our cultural assets, such as the museum, the arts centre, the town hall and the library. So, I mean, all large towns and cities have to rethink their priorities following the Second World War. And now we're doing the same again today. So I wonder what will the future of Paisley be? Are we ahead of the curve in centering culture and our regeneration strategy? Well, what can be said for sure is that uh, as a town, we certainly don't lack ambition. And that's been the case in the past. And I think that's that's the case now. Thanks very much. Morwenna, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> um, uh, you've really brought us up to date. That, that splendid uh, <laughs> phrasing, ahead of the curve, pioneering modernity. Uh, what, what, could, what could be a better way to um, uh, end up the, the last of these uh, presentations? And also, you even gave us a little bit of controversy, a little a bit, a bit to argue over, whether it's the old jail or whether it's brutalism. Um, <laughs> But even in the case yeah. of Paisley, I, I, I think Paisley's brutalism is just a shade above everyone else's. I, I love the Hutchison, <laughs> uh, Lock and Monk uh, uh, county buildings. And I, I, I do share a little of your concern about seeing them made uh, trick and, uh, tricky and, uh, and easy to the eye. But I understand entirely uh, why that was done. Um, we, we now, thank, thank you, we, we, we now move on uh, to... Um, to the uh, question session, uh, to our discussion, our panel discussion. And I wonder if we have uh, any uh, questions actually from um, our audience. I'm just looking to the, um, to the, the, the scorecard. I know our audience has been very active in saying nice things uh, about each of our speakers as well they might. I think it's been a really uh, splendid uh, set of presentations for you all. And I think also we've, we've had quite a a cumulative uh, understanding from this. I think it all does um, add up a little. And just while I wait to see if anything comes through from the audience, let, let me kick off the, 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 the conversation um, with you all. I mean, do you feel that this all adds up, that we can actually see trends during the 19th century, perhaps in the challenges themselves, but also perhaps in the, um, in, in, in the solutions to them? Um, moving uh, uh, chronologically, as we did in our presentations, um, Fiona, do you think that there's a, that it all adds up to something here, and that we're seeing something that we can put our finger on? 
Yeah, I think what's going to be interesting is how towns um, and their neighbouring other towns and cities kind of partner um, in an effective way. Um, I was part of a debate last night where people were arguing that Glasgow's center, uh, city centre needs to be repopulated. People need to be living in the city centre and the same can be said of, of Paisley. But I think the great strength about today's technology and today's transport and ease of communications is that towns such as Paisley don't need to go it alone. Um, you know, they have near neighbours um, and although they've got their own personalities, their own characteristics, their own wonderful sets of buildings, I think what's going to be interesting is whether a place like Paisley, you know, can actually, what will be interesting is if um, inspiration comes from trying to be just that bit better than the neighbour. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be quite interesting. And I think actually Paisley is showing signs of the sort of ambition that that makes it want to outstrip its neighbours and retain its identity. Uh, and I, th I think that's going to be interesting. I'm fascinated, for instance, how Paisley and Dumbarton are quite similar in some respects. But Dumbarton has demolished its 1960s brutalist um, town um, headquarters, whereas Paisley at least retained some of theirs. Um, I'm really glad Valerie showed uh, the, the Civic Centre because myself, I'm a fan and I do regret uh, the, the demolition of part of it. You know, I, I do like a bit of concrete, I've got to, I've got to admit. Um, but I think yes. Paisley is showing a tremendous um, kind of ambition through its future Paisley project. And uh, I think it is going to be, it's going to be interesting to, to actually sort of see what happens. From my, from my perspective, there are still too many redundant buildings. There's too much heritage that's, that's in a poor state of repair. Um, and there's got to be more of a move towards repurposing of buildings and a more of a concentration on, on doing that and not losing any more, uh, unnecessarily losing any more. Um, and, you know, I'm now a fan after having had to do my presentation of Jay Steele Maitland's tobacco factory <laughs> on Green Hill Road, uh, which, you know, I think we need to be doing something with. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, um, Fiona. Um, uh, Bruce, you gave a very um, uh, vibrant uh, um, uh, look at what was happening um, at that particular period. Do you think that that's got much relevance? How can you relate that to, 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 to um, our um, current uh, issues with pa the centre of Paisley? Do you see them linked in any way? Well, first of all, I completely agree with <clears throat> the first answer, Fiona's. Um, I, I think a, a major problem in West Central Scotland is uh, very often uh, insufficient wealth flowing in local economies, uh, hence the empty buildings. And that uh, relates to issues that are long going and long long standing and, and have deep roots about um, prosperity and it, its proximal causes. I think another major problem in Britain as a whole provincial Britain is that in the UK power is highly concentrated and in Scotland power is highly concentrated in Edinburgh and it's arguable that local civic authorities if they had more means to act could do a lot more. I mean one of the things that we uh, saw through the presentations was the kind of fluctuations of politics and economics, uh, the Great Depression, the responses to that, this tremendous rise in the civic after the Second World War, you know, leading to the construction of all that splendid new housing and the civic centre and so on and so forth. And then that being significantly rolled back from the 1980s. Um, with regard to the particular subject I was talking about, um, I, I think that perhaps in this era when we are concerned with the effects of pollution and environmental degradation that actually um, suburban sprawl is just what we don't want more of. Um, 
actually there is a, a someone who was born in Glasgow but who lives in Edinburgh. I find it interesting that there's been a general uh, depopulation of the west of Scotland as an ongoing trend. It's urban areas in the Clyde and a big increase in population in uh, places like East Lothian. And that's because of issues of quality of life and also better planning. So uh, I think it's very important to preserve green belt. And I think it's very important to make good use of existing assets, heritage assets, the very beautiful center of Paisley, and um, to proceed on that basis and to make very careful good decisions because every bad planning decision that's made, every fine building that's needlessly lost actually doesn't push things in the required direction. Thank, thanks, uh, uh, thanks very much, um, uh, uh, Bruce. Um, I just wonder what your your take on that. Skipping the the artistic side of things for just a second, uh, I'm just going to to move to uh, Valerie uh, there and um, ask, um, you know, what would be your take on that? Um, do you think uh, that um, you know a vibrant centre, uh, a vibrant vibrant future could potentially lie ahead, just like the the vibrant moves that you've noted uh, towards the end of the 20th century? I think, I mean, I think I have a lot of sympathy for the, the planners and architects and, and sort of technocrats that had to make these decisions after the Second World War. I mean, fortunately in Paisley and Glasgow, we didn't have bomb damage from the Second World War, but there was like you know, massive social problems that needed to be dealt with. And they chose very ambitious solutions, including, you know, regional policy, which essentially meant moving the population and industry out of Glasgow all around the country. And I think that just as Glasgow lost out from that, probably so too did Paisley. But at the same time, we became a regional centre, which is why we had the Civic uh, the Civic Centre and the money that was spent on that and the Piazza. And then Linwood's car factory, which would never have been there had it not been for regional policy. So it was the big hand of the state making these decisions and moving people in an industry where they felt they should be. And we can't do that now. And it maybe wasn't it maybe wasn't the right policy in the first place. They they just needed big solutions to big problems. And I think now um, using culture as the, the, the driver of regeneration for Paisley, for me, is a is a good way to go because it does help repurpose our existing um, built environment. Um, and like um, Fiona, I've got similar concerns for for some of the empty buildings that are in the town, like the Burton's building, which is in a terrible state, or the Liberal Club, or even the YMCA building, and quite a lot of the buildings that, that Fiona showed us are, are not, but the councils in, don't own those buildings, so it's very difficult for them to take charge there and do something about it. Um, the owners are just sitting on them and they're, and they're being run down. Um, so it, it seems to me there needs to be some sort of urban land reform. Is there a room for an, a, a new old town corporation almost? <laughs> is that the sort of thing that, <laughs> I mean, we, that we should be we really should be reinventing the new as, as the old almost or, or the other way around? Uh, uh, it seems to me the plan uh, to bring people back back into living in the town centre is the way to go. So just as Fiona was saying, the discussion was about that in Glasgow. I think it would work in Glasgow too. Glasgow city centre is in a terrible state, I think, personally. Um, all the empty, vacant retail space. So you think something dramatic has to be done and we need to really think uh, differently about And that's hard. That's what people were having to do after the Second World War, think differently about society. That's kind of what we need to do. Um, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, bright yeah, new ideas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah certainly. That, 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 that. Thank you. That's. I'm getting uh, questions coming in now, left, right, and centre. And I've also got Stuart, <laughs> who's just wanting to add something. I think on this on this very point. Um, Stuart, fire away. Wherever you are. Oh, you're not there. Thanks. Sorry. Never mind. Uh, am I here? And are you hearing me? Yes. Uh, I am hearing you. Very much, Michael. I am hearing you. Great. Great. Listen, it was just to just to add into a little bit about what Valerie was saying, and uh, and I think uh, a lot of what she said is is really heartening to hear um, about the the ways in which I suppose we as a as a, as a as a modern era um, uh, local authority and, and uh, uh, 
urban regenerists and planners, etc., have 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 be, have our have the way we, we now need to work is is in a very in a very collaborative way. Um, and the I was fascinated by the um, the the Valerie's um, uh, discussion about the comprehensive development areas and the and the powers of the chief engineers and the and the city architects of the past and their ability to move things so fast um and so comprehensively um and and we are now in a position of course of of, of doing things in a very, very different manner um and trying to work with the grain of our of our places um and in the communities and with everybody and and uh, that, that has stakes in those um particularly the owners of properties and the owners of buildings um and i'm and i look back i suppose on um i've been working with remshire council and its regeneration team for the last dozen years um, and we've had, I think we've had some terrific successes, um, but born of real sort of hard graft and, and bringing um, a lot of very significant public sector funding to bear on particular projects. That, um, and, and that's, you know, that's the reality of what we have at the moment um, in being able to move on certain priority priorities and priority buildings within the town centre. So as Bruce said, the the flow of of individual wealth is perhaps not there that where it used to be but that that is the role of 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 the, the public sector there now so mm -hmm. some of my most favorite projects um uh, things like the things like the russell institute and the the refurb of the art center and, and of course the ongoing stuff that's happening at the museum and, and and the town hall these are um big sort of once in a in, in several generation type investments that the public sector is making as as I think some of the really critical platforms for moving Paisley's town centre and, and Paisley as a as an entity, as a town forward now. So, um, so I think those platforms are being built, they're being built in different sort of ways to um, the things that happened in the 1950s uh, and the way things that happened in the 1950s. But um, uh, that, that I think is the, um, the, str the strategy and the approach that, that we're now taking within the town. Um, and a, a hope, you know, in fifty years' time, there's a, there's another group of professionals on a on a similar call talking talking about what was happening <laughs> after the, the future Paisley <laughs> exhibition and the vision report and all these sorts of things. The seminal points in the in the the history of uh, of, of Paisley in, in 2020. Stuart, I, I, I've got a, a whole series of, of questions which I'm wanting to ask, and they are specifically on these, but I do just want to, I don't want to leave Mar Marwena out. So first of all, I just want to ask Marwena a very quick question about, um, uh, you know, the whole artistic side of things and her own experience of Paisley. Um, keep your eye on Paisley, Paisley uh, Disraeli uh, famously and perhaps even notoriously said in the 19th century. So keep your eye on Paisley. You've been keeping your eye on Paisley. You've been having a good look at us. I mean, what, what do you think are the chances there? Is, is, uh, are, are we, is there material there you think that can really um, uh, create a new urban renaissance in Paisley? Uh, absolutely. I mean, Paisley, I mean, no matter where you go, anywhere in the world, any place that people live has an interest in history. But Paisley has a particularly rich cultural history. And uh, I think the thing that, that I'm so fond of in Paisley is the kind of, if you want to, the access to culture at street level. So like the Secret Museum or the Threadmill Museum and all these like, I don't know if it's correct to call them like community groups, but it feels like that. like people, buddies who are so invested in the history of their town, getting together and probably a lot of it is like unpaid labour that they do to, to keep all of their that, this history archive for, for people, for everybody and for people like me to come along and, and learn more about it. And I think that that's it. It just feels like, you, you know, you don't have to get like a special passcode, like a card to get into a special building to then go up 10 flights of stairs to, to look at stuff. Stuff. It's right there, and you 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 can you can access it so so clearly, so so easily. So I think that's really important, and that needs there needs to be more of that um, everywhere, um, but also in Paisley. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Marwen. I, I I mean I. I, I... I agree so much. I mean, even looking at Paisley from the outside, for people who whiff pass 
on the motorway. It really has this identity sitting there. You see all these towers and spires rising up. It really is the archetypal uh, uh, vision of a really interesting place. It has a real sort of identity. Now, I, I just want to move on to the questions we've been getting. And I know that many of you have actually addressed the, the general um, uh, theme of these questions. And I'm going to try and group them together a little. I, I've got, for example, I've got Helen Glassford asking if we can, should consider compulsory buyback for Paisley's heritage buildings, as a, presumably a, a community um, o, uh, option. Uh, and we've also got Duncan McIntosh asking about a specific building, uh, the Maitland's building, the building by Maitland on Forbes Place, why it hasn't been developed, because actually, he says, that's owned by the council. So um, just starting mm -hmm. off with that sort of double whammy, anyone got any views on that? Anyone like to respond to that one? Stuart, you're probably speaking most on <laughs> Yes, I'm, I think I'm the probably council. the one that's, the one that's head for some of that. Sorry, sorry um, to the, the, the big finger to... to uh, that's to, okay. Um... <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, I think there's... Uh, it's quite interesting. There was a couple of buildings as well that Valerie had, had sort of um, mentioned in passing as well. Um, a, the, uh, the YMCA and the, the Liberal Club, for example. Um, so it's not just it's not there are there are a number of really sort of key beautiful buildings in the town centre that um, uh, are currently vacant um, and are showing all sorts of signs of wear and tear, and 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 the one in Forbes Place is absolutely owned by owned by the council. We are, I think, uh, without giving a, a lot away, but we know the owners of all of those buildings. Um, we're working actually quite closely with all of them, um, or indeed prospective purchasers of some of those buildings. And as I was saying, my contact uh, um, comments previously, we're really interested in in, in getting into um, the nitty gritty of some of these and trying to unlock what is it going to take to be able to um, uh, deliver a project, a new purpose. Uh, for that space, because a lot of this is about what is the purpose of that space, and if a new new purpose can be found, a new business case for it can be found, then that's the platform upon which we can start to think about well, what what types of grant and grant investments can we bring around that to enable that to happen. So um, there are lots of specific examples, and I'm sure the audience would come could come up with a, quite a long list of of, of examples. Um, but there's an awful lot of these that that we we work on probably as a almost as a, um, a part of our day to day, if not day to day, then certainly week to week um, type uh, type um, approach. Um, and on on things like compulsory purchase, and there's also discussions, of course, going on about uh, at Scottish government level about compulsory sales orders as well. Um, all of these things are are, are measures by which. Um, a, it's it's intended to try and unlock, I suppose, um, buildings that have got stuck for whatever reason um, uh, and are just not coming back onto the market or not coming uh, through in terms of development packages. Um, and they are, you know, they are they're they're pretty. You know, you do you do not um, uh, delve into those um, lightly. I think is probably the, the only thing that I would say about those. I've only ever done. Um, one in my sort of 30 year plus career, etc. So um, you have to be very, very sure of your ground and sure of the fact that it's the right, the right mechanism, the right lever to pull. And very often it's not actually the right lever to pull. But there are very little, and there are very little incentives often open. Um, one can pursue repair notices, but that's such a fraught business. The the mechanism itself, and that's that's not a a, a problem set up by. Um, local governments, it's a, a problem um, set up centrally um, in the sense that um, it, you know, it's a nettle that people are very unwilling to grasp. I, I mean, you could you envisage, any of you, could you envisage a situation in which uh, there might actually be a demand from uh, uh, individual councils to actually lobby central government behind the scenes to, to try and sort out the difficulties associated with actually having a system of repairs orders which actually work? Because 
all too often we end up with um, mm -hmm. having to wait for a dangerous buildings notice, which of course is often the very opposite of repair. It, it, it's literally removing bits to stop the building being dangerous, which is not um, uh, the idea of addressing a, a problem before it becomes a, a big one. Anyone got any uh, uh, comments on that? Um, Someone's well, mentioned Fergus the Park as well. Why is that? Why well, that, that's a sort of problem, an ongoing problem. Anyone got any knowledge or information on that? Um, With regard to the compulsory practice of buildings, um, one of the issues, of course, is that British local authorities uh, don't generally have funds uh, and the legal risks are incredibly high. And it's this is a nationwide problem and one sees uh, significant buildings like, for example, the Egyptian chambers in Union Street in Glasgow by Alexander Thompson or uh, I think, you know, Paisley Gilmer Street station is such a beautiful railway station, one of the great surviving artifacts of the Glasgow and Southwestern Railway. Um, and you'll see some Glasgow and Southwestern carriages behind me, incidentally, so I'm a big admirer of it. These were made by my grandfather. Um, Air Station Hotel is a tragic example. And uh, this is a building that is apparently owned by some property developer in, I think, Thailand. And I believe I might be wrong, but I believe that the local authority has actually had the greatest difficulty either find, you know, making contact with this individual at all. So um, I would say that it would be marvelous, uh, and I believe that things are being done at, at a central uh, governmental level to um, make it more possible to uh, intervene because uh, there are listed buildings all over the country that are falling into rack and ruin precisely because of this type of neglect. Mm, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, timely intervention, I think, is probably the the, the, the phrase for it. It's it, it, the the tragedy of Air Station Hotel is um, it's certainly that it has taken so long, so long that in fact the the, the uh, cause is almost uh, um, well, it's a very difficult one. Um, I, I'm getting a question here, a very interesting one from Edith, Edith Smith, saying, "How do we get people uh, living uh, back?" in the high street. How do we actually um, create that? I mean, we can look at uh, Glasgow's Merchant City many, many years ago. It was a private public partnership that actually brought people in. It pump primed the whole thing for the private sector. Is that sort of thing that could happen in Paisley? Anyone got any views on that? Any? Uh... Yeah, I guess it's about making the town centre desirable and convenient. So it's about bringing back more than just housing at upper floor level, but having the ground floor inhabited. And as Valerie mentioned, bringing back sort of things like cinemas um, and kind of niche shops and making it somewhere that people don't have to walk terribly far to get to culture, to get to entertainment, to, you know, get to sort of like fitness. Um, it, it's very, very difficult if you've got uninhabited ground floors on a high street to conceive of people really wanting to live at the upper levels. Um, because at night, um, you know, there's a there's a kind of, you know, a lack of activity. So you need something that's got some kind of dynamism at night as well as during the day, but in a kind of safe way. Um, and that that's really what, what, what you need. And it doesn't need to be big scale. It can be small scale. It can be about creating opportunities for pop-ups in empty shops. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think that's just for Paisley's, you know, length of high street of its, of its own. That's the sort, mm -hmm. of, sort of thing that can help. Mm -hmm. well, and, and perhaps what might help, sorry, carry on, please, please do carry I was, on. I was going to say, even in terms of safety, like from where I live in Paisley, walking from Gilmer Street home, even the student residences that are above the piazza has made a huge difference to the amount of people who are about in the town. So I feel a lot safer walking home now, knowing that there's there's folk in the street, whereas before. So that's been amazing having the student the student residence there. So it's things like that, just getting people. It's, it's <laughs> to be honest, it doesn't need to be expensive. It doesn't need to be lots of flats. Another thing that's made a huge difference is that the Townscape Heritage Project has done above used to be a chip shop. Shop. I don't, can't remember what that street's called, but on County Square, that's all been refurbished. It's lovely, it makes a difference. It doesn't feel, 
I don't know what the word is, a derelict as much as... And I know that there's plans to to kind of uh, refurbish the whole area around County Square to make it more inviting. But these yeah. things are all adding up in the town and making it a better place to live, I would say. You say it's all adding up, Fiona and Valerie. Would you sort of agree that um, what really helps is not just uh, flinging money at individual buildings, not just doing single product projects, but having a sort of integrated approach that invites people back into an area that's, as you say, secure, well-managed, um, mm -hmm. and that also um, is perhaps quite uh, well-zoned, so the, the flat, the, the dream flat that you buy or that you rent doesn't end up next to the, the dream nightclub that you might only want to visit <laughs> every weekend. Um, you know? um, would you agree that that kind of uh, need for integration in, in, in solutions is something that's really, really important? With, yeah, like I, would, I mean, Stuart can speak to that, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay, Stuart, you, you have a, a, a good <laughs> that one. Integration. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And the, the, big, the big vision report that was uh, published a couple of years ago is, is kind of all about that. It's, it's, it's trying to sort of figure out that the um, a town centre should be a melting pot of a lot of different things. And there's, there's many, many aspects to a town centre that makes it a vibrant place um, and an exciting place. But also that from a residential perspective, it can be an attractive place and one that you um, want to be able to sort of um, live, live, a, live a, a comfortable and an enjoyable life in no matter what age you are, what life stage you're at. So, so a lot of development that you currently see within, the, within Paisley Town Centre um, is uh, there's, there's some student flats going up and there's some, uh, some uh, other residential development going in uh, in and around the old Arnott's uh, site, uh, which several sort of, you know, several hundred of uh, flats, etc. coming in. I think that one of our, um, but these these are almost new build, I suppose, and the, the really interesting projects, and it was interesting that Valerie mentioned the County Place one, the really interesting one is where we've actually managed to get hold of, a, of an opportunity to re-establish residential in some of the older buildings that have that, that lost the residential purpose to them several years ago. Um, and there are architectural reasons for that as well that maybe Fiona could, could sort of comment on just in terms of the, the way in which some of those buildings have um, been are, are structured and how you then sort of unlock them again for, uh, for more modern living um, is I think another aspect of, um, mm -hmm. of, of work that would be really interesting to, to get into. I don't know if we'll have time today to, to sort of get into that sort of conversation. But um, Fiona and Valerie are absolutely right that if you get that mix right, that blend of activity with a, within a town centre, it supports a residential population and then a residential population in itself supports and underpins a lot of those, uh, a lot of the vitality that, that you would expect to see in retail, in cultural, um, uh, in food and drink offer, et cetera. So it becomes uh, uh, a, perfect, a perfect circle is formed. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, uh, just to, to catch up on some comments, uh, we've had a comment from uh, Lil Brooks, who's giving uh, her support uh, for urban land reform. I think that's something that uh, a lot of us would probably uh, go along with quite uh, quite strongly, the need to help you sort out these problems which often occur in uh, in, in town centres. Um, what else are we getting? Oh, yes, Jackie Sands is asking uh, if Paisley is going to be responding to context um, or um, instigating it, in other words, uh, I, I, I think, is it going to be the, the, the driver itself or is it uh, simply going to, in a sense, be, be uh, driven um, by, uh, by circumstances? Um, I, I, that, I know that's a difficult question to answer and uh, it depends on a great deal, but any observations on that, um, anyone on, on the idea that, uh, um, you know, the drivers for change, to what extent are we um, going to inevitably going to be a victim, or to what extent can we really um, break new ground and and uh, you know plough a new furrow in this? Anyone got a particular view on that? Well, not not nothing exists in a vacuum, um, and, and Paisley has a wonderful context already, and I think that since the standout buildings. Uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, Paisley's responded more to context than initiated it. And initiating context, probably less about built context and, and more about 
kind of social habits, technology, and so on and so forth. But I mean, Paisley has a wonderful context. So why wouldn't you use that as, as something to respond to and inspiration for the future? Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, I think we can uh, uh, pretty well uh, wrap things up now. We've we've uh, we've discussed quite interestingly a lot of what um, uh, you know the ramifications of what we've been um, we've been talking about. I'd just like to uh, thank you all for taking part very much indeed, and uh, thank you very much to um, Colin and his team, to Stuart, and uh, of course to the the technical people at Camerons for uh, for making all the, this all run so uh, seamlessly uh, behind the scenes. Um, it's been uh, great to talk with. With you all it's a fascinating subject and a fascinating place and all i can say is keep your eye on paisley thank you all very much indeed <laughs>